doctrine. Isn't that what causes so much confusion and division? Teaching, that's just about knowing words and being clever, right? Why should all of that matter to me? These issues and more will be explored in this edition of Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden, where we're on episode 16, God's Body Builders. That will teach you. Word Search is a place to search God's word and a time for God's word to search us, where we encourage godly character development that stimulates seeking God's kingdom first and his righteousness in the hope that that should inform and transform our prayer and practice. For here at Word Search, we seek to find treasure in God's word so that we can be hearers and doers of that word for his glory. On today's Word Search, we will cover what we previously explored on the subject at hand, which is God's fit body plan. And then we'll consider carefully our core reading in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, before looking at Jesus the teacher, exploring the conversations from teacher to teacher, and then concluding what it is to learn when that will teach you. And then we'll put that together with God's fit body plan, how that works together, and the review of key hints that we can see on how God builds his body before concluding as ever, with some key prayer points. So, our series that we're considering at the moment is one called God's Fit Body Plan, and it's on the basis of that every believer is a member of the body of Christ, and that means that every believer belongs in Christian fellowship. And part of God's plan for his body is that every part of his body should function, and that that should lead to the fact that the body should function well when each part plays its role. How we explore that together was first of all, considering the overview of Ephesians, what Paul is driving up with the book of Ephesians, and then narrowing down to consider carefully Ephesians chapter four. And in that section, we also considered what Jesus's plan is for his body the genius of the plan that saw Jesus as the foundation and Jesus as the head of his body, the church. And how his body is built is based on certain key body builders, the first of which that we explored was the apostle. And we also considered him alongside the role of the prophet and the role that they have in both establishing the church and then building it from within so that they're very keen to hear and be responsive to the word of God. From there, we looked at the role of the evangelist and how that evangelist is there to encourage the saints to be about the business of sharing the good news of the kingdom, sharing the good news of who Jesus is. How crucial that is both within the church to stimulate the church to be up and about doing that and how they exemplify that in the connections that they make, such as their passion for the body of Christ. Last week, we looked at the issue of the shepherd and how the shepherd is God's particular manservant or maidservant put in there to serve the body of Christ in nurturing, caring, and protecting the sheep, the sheep that Jesus himself is the good shepherd over. So we looked at those areas, and obviously this week we'll be covering the issue of the teacher, and we're doing those things in the knowledge that it's good to know where you fit in the body of Christ and then how we all fit together to function as God wants us to. And that's why this week in particular, we're paying careful attention to the teacher. And so let's read once more the core scripture that allows us to understand that. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. And that says as follows. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Father, in the name of your precious son, Jesus, thank you so much for your plan to build your body for your glory. At this time, open our hearts and our minds to understand what you have us to understand in the light of the key role that teachers play in the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry so that the body of Christ can be built to maturity. We long to do what is pleasing to you. Help us at this time now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, for your glory, Lord God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you'll notice Paul is keen that we should be mature so that we will not be carried about by every wind of doctrine. Hmm. So that gives us a clear indication of the key role that teaching has to play in the building of the body of Christ. As ever with these five particular gifts, it's my conviction that Jesus personifies and exemplifies them all brilliantly. So it'll be worth our while exploring how does Jesus fit the role of being the teacher? And I want us to consider that in the light of two particular scriptures, Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 29, and then John chapter 8 verses 31 to 38. Let's have a look at what those chapters have to say to us at this time. Matthew chapter 7 says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. So that's what Matthew has to outline in terms of Jesus in that scripture. Let's go over to see what John has to highlight about the nature of Jesus, our teacher, according to chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, uh, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Uh, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do 
what you have heard from your father. So we have these two fascinating scriptures that give an indication of the role of Jesus as a teacher. And it's worth pointing out first and foremost that when we consider what a teacher is, a teacher is somebody who is caught up with the matter of both knowing and sharing wisdom and truth. They are caught up with that. Indeed, great teachers, first and foremost, are great students. They take the time to learn and study. And you might say to yourself, well, well is that what Jesus did? Uh, don't take my word for it. If you read the scripture, you will discover yourself that Jesus in Luke grew in grace and in wisdom. And indeed, he is our example because of what he learned through the things that he endured. So great teachers are great students. But what makes them particularly great students? Great teachers is their desire to communicate because of their in-depth, intimate knowledge. What it is to both have wisdom and truth. That's particularly clear when you see how Jesus makes the rather bold statement that those who hear what he says is like a wise man. Whereas those who hear what he says and doesn't bother putting into action is like a fool. That is to say that Jesus' teachings are the teachings of wisdom that lead to truth. And then we see the truth element in what Jesus says in John, where he says quite clearly that if you abide in my word, that is to say, if you make it your point of duty to live in what I say, what I teach, what I express, then you really will be free, but you'll be free because of your intimate knowledge of truth. Uh, we see in the encounter between Jesus and Pilate on one occasion that Pilate was rather intrigued by Jesus's claim to truth that led him to ask the question, what is truth? And Jesus doesn't answer him because, uh, well, I am not to say that Jesus doesn't answer him because of this, but it's fascinating to discover that what is truth is an interesting question. But Jesus in John here is saying, who is truth? is the far more important question to consider. So that knowledge of who is truth and the exploration of who is truth as you abide yourself in his word is the key that unlocks the door to your liberty, to truly being free. And notice this as well, it's not just being free, it's being free from sin. So all of that is to say that that gives us a good indication when we see how Jesus operates as a teacher. That gives us a good indication of what it is to be a teacher. We see in the word in the Gospels, especially that Jesus came teaching and Jesus came making disciples. And the way that you make disciples is to teach them. So he was there very carefully teaching them by his example as well as by his instruction. So whenever he would instruct his disciples to do something, more often than not, it was on the basis of them having witnessed what he had put into action previously. So Jesus uh, was a great teacher in that sense. And it's interesting to consider then the issues of what Jesus taught and noticing that what he taught is fundamental to our existence. So uh, Jesus didn't teach uh, maths or biology or sociology, but he did teach wisdom and life and truth, among other things. So he was very committed to allowing people to be realigned with what it is to really live and to know that to really live is to live under the rulership of God, live under the kingdom of God. And when you live under his rule, there is a right relationship with God, there's a right relationship within yourself, and that can cultivate right relationships with others because that's the reality of what life is all about. And so Jesus didn't just teach those things, um, he didn't just teach those things verbally, he would express those things in his relationships with his disciples and his engagement and relationship with others. So that's the content of what he taught in terms of all of that summarized in that great line of the kingdom of God. The content of what he taught was fundamental. So he clearly had a curriculum 
uh, that was a bit more substantial than most people's national curriculums. Let's put it that way. But it's not just what he taught in terms of his content. It was how he taught in terms of his delivery. Matthew chapter 5 to 7 is referred to by some as the Sermon on the Mount, which is a bit baffling when you consider that at the start of it, it says that Jesus sat down to teach his disciples. And then at the end of it, it says that the people were amazed at his teaching. Uh, so somebody would, would have thought that Matthew chapter 5 to 7 should have been called the teaching on the, on the Mount. But far be it from me to suggest that it was a preacher that called it the Sermon on the Mount. Nevertheless, in those particular episodes in Matthew chapter 5 to 7, even in those, it's fascinating to see how Jesus teaches. So he doesn't necessarily spend too long on what he's saying, but the content as well, and the delivery in which he shares it, and the way that he will sometimes use pictures to portray what he's saying is just the tip of the iceberg of the variety of ways that Jesus will teach. So sometimes he'll teach in a conversation. Sometimes he'll teach by the questions that he asks, as well as the questions that he leaves behind in the light of his teachings. But as we see in Matthew chapter 7, what's very clear is that Jesus is one who teaches with authority, uh, which is to give the impression that Jesus is teaching not as somebody who is reciting the words of great scribes. So he says Rabbi X and Rabbi Z and Rabbi whatever. He's not teaching like that, depending on the references that he's going to. He's teaching as though he knows what he's talking about and he can talk with that degree of what I say is true, because it's rather a confident thing to say, if you do what I say, you'll be wise, whereas if you don't do what I say, you're a fool. Likewise, it's very confident to be able to turn around to Jews and say, actually, you have been slaves. You've been a slave to sin. Indeed, you are still a slave to sin, because notice, unlike your dad Abraham, you're trying to kill me. That takes a great deal of boldness and confidence uh, that we can see Jesus is very much rooted in that confidence of boldness in the fact that he is the authority, for he is indeed the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that starts it all and finishes it all. So the methods of how he teaches, the use of pictures, the use of parables, what's fascinating as well in terms of that method of teaching is a lot of people talk about how Jesus makes things clear to everyone. And yet, those parables were deliberately delivered so that you'd have to decipher what Jesus meant by what he was saying. So crowds might have been amazed and said, yeah, well, look at that parable. Isn't that an entertaining parable? But like the disciples, if they had anything about them, they'd have to go back and say to Jesus, "Uh, what did you mean? So that is to say that it wasn't Jesus's job to always make things plain on the surface, but he would challenge you to say, if you really want to know the truth of the matter, let's dig a bit deeper together. So the various methods in which Jesus would teach are fascinating and worth exploring for yourself. There's both how he taught and also when he taught. So it's not just the fact that he taught in the synagogue, but you'll notice that he taught in a variety of places. You're having a meal, Jesus would teach. You're on a ship, Jesus would teach. You're on a journey, Jesus would teach. You're in a vineyard, Jesus would teach. It's as though Jesus would be able to make a connection with everything around us in life and use that as a teaching point. And again, it would be natural. It's not as though Jesus would have to contrive something to suggest, hmm, I need a five-point PowerPoint presentation to be able to deliver this. So let me see how I can do this. No, it was very natural for Jesus to just make those connections and use humor and use life and use relationships and be contentious and be controversial and say some things that would make people think twice uh, when it came to things. All of those as part of his teaching because he wasn't there to teach people to keep them comfortable. He was there to teach people so that they could follow the path of righteousness. So there's what he taught There's how he taught. And then notice with me, there's also who he taught. Very intriguing. So, yeah, he would teach the crowds and he teaches opponents as well. So a lot of scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees would come up and challenge him with questions. And he would still use that opportunity 
to teach them. So he would even teach his opponents. But what's at the heart of the teaching in terms of the building of the body of Christ is the amount of time that Jesus took to teach his disciples. Indeed, that's why a number of his followers would refer to him as a rabbi, because we too should realize that a relationship with him should allow us to see ourselves as disciples as his disciples did. But if that, if we're his disciples, that makes him our teacher, our rabbi, and not just a teacher in that way that some of us may be used to in terms of a, um, a board or a classroom or something like that, but this wonderful expression of teaching, that is to say it's communicating life in all of its aspects in different ways. And it's as much in action as it is with instruction. So those are fascinating things to look at when we consider Jesus the teacher. And that's part of what makes him a great teacher. And I say it's what, what, it's what is part of what makes him a great teacher because there are people from other religions and even atheists who would say, oh, yeah, Jesus is teaching. Yeah, they're very good. Yeah, 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 yeah. The golden rule. Yeah, 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 yeah. All of that stuff. And yet, in that, they miss the very heart of what Jesus is really teaching. Because what Jesus is really teaching isn't just how to be a nice person or how to be a good person. It's really how to recognize what's true and what's wise. And the basis of what's true and what's wise is a right relationship with God. A right relationship that Jesus would go on to express such a love for that he would die for those who would come to know him and to know that knowing him is to know life eternal. Those are critical elements of the teaching that cannot be just overlooked in the light of the pleasantness of saying lovely things like, oh, you should love one another and care for each other. Lovely stuff, very real, very true, very important. But there's more to Jesus, the teacher, than that. So now I want us to make a transition then from seeing Jesus, the great teacher, to seeing how he would then translate from the teacher to others who should be teachers, and then how that too would continue on well after his death. So let's consider that in the light of two scriptures. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, and then 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10, all the way through to chapter 4 and verse 5. Matthew says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Paul would then go on to say to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Ah, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing that from knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. 
I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming where people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So I'm hoping that in the reading of those particular scriptures, we can see a degree of continuity between what Jesus exemplifies, what Jesus instructs, and then how the apostles would take it upon themselves to likewise exemplify and instruct. Let's see that in action in the scriptures. So Jesus, uh, in Matthew chapter 28, gives what is often called the Great Commission. And some people, I'm not going to point out which evangelists do this, but some people think that the great uh, thrust in that is to go. And they think, oh, go. We must go. Everyone must go. Um, and listen, that's important. Going is important. But as you read it carefully, there's an actual kind of an implication that you're going to go anyway. As in, when you're growing up, when you're living your life, there are places that you'll go. So you'll go in your house and you'll go to work and you'll go to other places. The key to this scripture isn't so much the go, it's what you do as you go. And the key then, the center, the heartbeat of this particular scripture, as I read it, subject to being corrected by men far greater than me and women, is that the heartbeat of this is to make disciples. Jesus' Jesus desire in the gospel, Jesus' thrust in the gospel, is that not just that people will be made to be converts or people will make decisions, but that people will be made to be disciples. And if you're a disciple, that means that you're a learner. And if you're a learner, it helps us if you have a teacher. And the greatest teacher is the one that we'll be blessed with, which is the Holy Spirit that points us to Jesus Christ himself. That's great. But in the making of disciples, it's clear that we make disciples by teaching them. So we can baptize them, and it's crucial to immerse them, disassociating them from the world that they've come from into the fullness of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's crucial. So they, they now pledge allegiance to God by being immersed in his name. Crucial, fundamental. But as well as that, that immersion then says that you are now committed to following the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. So who is supposed to teach them? Disciples. Disciples make disciples by teaching them. Teaching them to do what? To be able to recite scripture? No. Teaching them to observe everything that has been commanded to them. That is to say, a good disciple knows that they have been receiving commandments. Commandments from who? Commandments from Jesus. So Jesus himself has been discipling you and has been teaching you. And implicit in that, you have to go and make disciples yourself by teaching them. And the good news is, don't worry about it. There's no pressure. You don't have to suddenly get a degree and learn how to do PowerPoint presentations for YouTube channels. You don't have to do that. That's not what Jesus is saying. In the same way that he has a variety of ways of teaching, primarily by lifestyle, there is the opportunity that you have that if you hear the command and if you live out the command and you're a model of the command, it should give you the opportunity to likewise teach others to obey those commands. Commands, as we said before, like what it is to love God and what it is to love your neighbor. Those kind of key crucial commands that Jesus has given. And we can see from the time that Jesus said that in the book of Acts, chapter two, right at the end, right after Peter has given that wonderful uh, sermon, that wonderful preaching, if you preachers want it, 
had a wonderful preaching that encourages people to repent that the lifestyle of the church is marked by their attendance together, coming together to submit themselves to the teaching of the apostles. It's interesting that Acts chapter 2 in that section doesn't really stress on the preaching. It stresses more on the teaching. It stresses more on the fact that the community of grace recognized that to be the community of grace, they needed to follow good, sound teaching. And who better to give it than those who had been sent by Jesus to make disciples by teaching them. So that continued throughout the book of Acts that we can see uh, through the behavior and through the example of the apostles. But I want you to ask yourself the question, why do we have those books in the New Testament? Why do we have them? Think about it. All of those books in the New Testament, whether it's Acts or Paul's letters or James or Peter's letters or John's letters or Jude or all of, or, you know, all of those letters, why do we have them? Uh, I would like to put it to you that we have those letters because men were concerned that people would still live up to the teachings of the truth and wisdom of God in Christ Jesus. That is to say, those books are still continuing to respond to people's issues, to people's concerns, and to the real possibility that people could be swayed into following false doctrine, false teaching. And so we have these letters that address that by establishing what right teaching is, what good teaching is, what sound teaching is, what it is to be in step with the will and the word of God. Then when we consider what Paul has to say to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 going into chapter 4, it's fascinating again that here is a teacher teaching a teacher. Okay, to be clear, Paul has instructed Timothy to go to the church in Ephesus, and he's particularly instructed him to go there in the book in 1 Timothy to help to build and establish the church there, to ensure that it's established again on the foundations that Paul had spent three years ensuring that it was built on. So Paul is sent, sending Timothy there as an apostolic delegate to make sure that that work is done. And then in this letter, in his what is said to be his final letter, Paul is encouraging Timothy to carry on doing the variety of apostolic duties that he's there to do, do the work of an evangelist. And again here, he's particularly concerned that Timothy knows what it is to apply and to share sound, good teaching. Teaching that was modeled by Paul so that it can be followed by Timothy. So again, it's not just about talking the talk, it's about walking the walk. So it's really good to see those people who are in those kind of relationships where they can see that walk in action. Very crucial, because that walk isn't seen by what is performed or portrayed or displayed on a given service where somebody's in a suit talking from a platform. That walk is seen, uh, as, as my mate Daryl Coley used to sing, when the music stops. Uh, good. So it's important for us to realize that Paul is, has an authority to speak to Timothy in this way because he has modeled the kind of teaching that he expects Timothy to continue. Likewise, in the book of Timothy, um, the second book, the second letter to Timothy, Paul would go on to encourage Timothy not only to learn, but to then go on to pass on what he has learned to trustworthy men who will make it their point of duty to pass that on to others. So to keep that teaching model going. Here we can see the concern that Paul has for the church in that time because he is keen for Timothy to stay rooted in sound teaching because of the time that would come where false teaching would be promoted. Uh, this isn't the first time that Paul would share that concern. When we look in Acts chapter 20, Paul would share to the elders of Ephesus his concern that he knew that once he had left and gone to Jerusalem, not only would there be wolves that would come in among them and try to divide them with false teaching, he knew that even some of the elders there 
would not remain faithful to sound doctrine. So that is to indicate quite clearly the importance of sound doctrine. Teaching isn't just something to glibly say, oh, well, it's the source of all confusion and all division in the church. Sound teaching, the focus on who the teacher is, the focus on the way, the truth, and the life is so crucial in the life of the believer. It's so crucial because it keeps them firmly rooted in what is true. And that's why Paul would continue to encourage Timothy to make it his point of duty to make sure he was uh, reproving, rebuking, exhorting with patience and teaching, knowing that there would come a time where people would prefer to ignore sound teaching and just go off what would be pleasing to them. Uh, so it was then, so it is now, which is why it's good to find good teachers who make it their point of duty to only follow sound doctrine, that which is in line with the word of God, the will of God, and the way of God as seen through Christ Jesus, that which aligns with the power of the or authority of the kingdom of God in action that we see in the word, rather than compromises with the trends of the day, which is why we can remember, again, going back to Ephesians, that in Ephesians chapter 4, in those 11 to 16 area of those verses, we can see that Paul was saying, if we're established there, we will not be blown to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We won't be done that way because we would be established in the truth of who Jesus is, and we would have the wisdom to navigate and negotiate the choppy waters of some very seductive teachings that try to veer people to the left or to the right of what is true to God. So that's why it's crucial when we read these scriptures that Paul is encouraging Timothy, just as Jesus would encourage his apostles, that it's crucial that we should grow in knowing the teacher to be like him. And I want you to see that in terms of how Jesus says that the only way that you can teach them to observe all that I've commanded you is if you're observing all that I commanded you. And Paul is reiterating by saying, Timothy, you know what I commanded you and what I commanded you is in line with what Jesus commands. And so stay rooted in that. That's a sign of a good teacher, crucial in this day and age. So in the light of that, what conclusions can we reach about the teacher? First of all, it's crucial again that we go back to the source and remind ourselves that Jesus is the teacher and he has gifted his body with those that reflect that teaching element of his. Teachers primarily reflect him by their example and then through their instruction. So a good teacher isn't just somebody who talks the talk, but they walk the walk. And you can see that in their authenticity, in their vulnerability, in the reality of their ongoing dependence on God through Jesus Christ by the power of his spirit. And then we can see that teachers are among those who are gifted to build and equip the church. And they are gifted to do that. They build the church by allowing them to develop, allowing believers to develop on the reality and the truth and the wisdom of who Jesus is. And that equips the saints, hopefully, to carry on and do that the same themselves. And teachers do that by developing, instructing, and informing with the desire that listeners, learners, will like themselves be transformed. And you see that because the teachers themselves have a desire to be transformed by the word of God. Crucial then that the church has the teachers to stir us all up to recognize that we are called to teach. Every one of us in our own ways are called to encourage and challenge each other and teach others what it is to live as God wants us to live so that we can all grow to be like Christ. And thus our challenge as we're ever avoiding false teaching by focusing on the true teaching is to ask ourselves this one question. Can we see Jesus the teacher? Is he 
our what teacher? Does he really teach us? So now I want us to see how that all fits together in God's fit body plan. This is the plan that God has for how his body should be built. Let's remind ourselves that Jesus is the foundation. He is the example. And from there, he has sent apostles to make it their point of duty to be grounded in the word of God and share the word of God to new places to encourage the start and the development of new expressions and new communities of the body of Christ, building them with the truth and the crucial role that the prophets have to play as well in terms of them ever being sensitive to what God has to say by hearing him and communicating that so that the church can be corrected and encouraged in the, the way that they should go in the present time. Then we see the crucial role that the evangelist has to play in reminding the church and exemplifying for the church the importance of the good news of Jesus, broadcasting it, proclaiming it, delivering it, demonstrating it, however they can in both the individual and the collective sense. Then we have the role of the shepherd who nurture, provide, care, and protect the sheep of the great shepherd. And finally, we see, as we've seen today, the role of the teacher in building, developing people who are very keen to see the truth and the wisdom of God and build their lives on it. And not just build on it, but likewise go on to teach others what it is to follow in the way of Jesus Christ. So how does that fit into everything, especially when we see Jesus Christ ahead and the goal? How does that fit with the key hints that we are to review? One, hopefully today we have seen that the gift that God has sent to the body is the gift of the teacher. And it should teach us that the work of the ministry is to instruct to develop and to teach others to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that then that teachers are crucial members of the body of Christ, and we can see that that helps the body to function and how they fit in the functioning of the body is that stimulating power that helps us to grow on proper, on the best foundations, if you will. That should all matter because we cannot afford to just take it for granted that now that we're saved, it's all right. There's got to be the process of growth. And as we see, there's the ongoing warnings of us falling into false teaching by the left and the right from without and within. That's why it should matter to us that the role of the teacher is being played crucially for our development. In all of these things, it's great to know that as a part of the body, we know where we fit and how we all fit together to function as God wants us to. In the light of all of these explorations, here are some prayer points I want us to consider. First of all, let's praise God for Jesus, our rabbi. Jesus was very clear when he was instructing the disciples that nobody should establish themselves as a rabbi because Jesus himself is the rabbi. So let's be grateful to God that when we're looking for the teacher, we have the greatest teacher in Jesus. Let's not praise God just for that, though. Let's thank God that Jesus has seen it fit to give the body teachers that should reflect that teaching element of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, notice the word teachers. It's not just dependent on one person. There are, because there is the variety of ways that Jesus would teach, so there are a variety of people that can express that variety and diversity to really inform, instruct, and build the body of Christ as it needs to be built. So let's thank God for that. Then let's go on to ask God for the humility needed to hear, to learn, and to follow the instructions of those gifted teachers. We need that humility to be hearers and doers of his word. And then let's seek God for opportunities ourselves, not just to learn, but then to go on to put it into action and to model that which we've learned, and then to go on to teach others that which we've learned so that others too can grow to be more and more like Jesus. Finally, let's celebrate God, that his eternal purposes are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the living word 
a word that builds and teaches. Next time on Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden, we'll be going on to episode number 17, where we'll be considering God's bodybuilders putting them all together. So join me for that, uh, for what that looks like in terms of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd and the teacher, what that looks like for those to be put together for the equipping of the saints and for the building of the body of Christ. In the meantime, please remember to like this video uh, because those likes are very important for the uh, algorithm. And also share this video with your friends. Now, that's not important for the algorithm. That's important for the rhythm of life that we wish to develop so that others too are keyed into the power of the word that they can discover here at Word Search. So feel free to share it with your friends and your loved ones. Indeed, if you're going to be a good Christian, share it with your enemies as well, because that's how you know you love them, by sharing with them that which is good for them. Uh, don't forget, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel. Turn that notification bell, turn it on, give it the tick, so that you can be updated on the next episode of Word Search. And you can also uh, be notified on any other things that come up on this channel as well. Thank you so much for your subscription so far. But if you can help us to build more subscribers, it can help us to develop the word. If you'd like us to uh, also, if you'd like to also support the channel, uh, feel free to do so. Contact us on the uh, details given in the description below, and we would be more than happy to receive that support, knowing that it is supporting the ministry to help us to get the word out, carry across Christ by the life changing word. Oh, God, that's our desire. The number one way, though, that you can support what we're doing here is to apply what you hear in these sessions. That it's not just for the sake of speaking that we're doing this. It's with the desire that we should all grow to know who Jesus is more and more day by day. So please apply it. But in all of that, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this week's episode of word search it means a lot to us here it particularly means a lot to me that you should take the time to listen thank you so much it is appreciated for here at word search we're really keen that we should find treasure in god's word so that we can be hearers and doers of that word for his glory now until next time on word search with me christopher